everyone. Good morning. <laughs> Are there many people who are new, who just arrived today for the first time? No? You were all here yesterday, were you? Uh, okay. Okay, one. One at the back. Okay, two, three. A few of you. Okay, good. Welcome. It's nice about this kind of retreat is that we have different stages, uh, so you can come and go a little bit. Uh, it's quite handy, yeah, so you can kind of choose your preferred part, which is kind of nice, or you can come for everything, or you can do whatever you like. Uh, I think this is quite, personally, I think it's quite a nice setup, but uh, uh, anyway. So um, now we have come more to the meditation, more, a bit more meditation on this part of the retreat. Uh, so far we have been talking a lot. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit less on this next part, uh, uh, which is good. Uh, because sometimes too much talking just makes the mind busy and you can't really relax properly, you can't get into the meditation practice properly. Uh, so this morning I'm going to give a little bit more of a, an extended talk about meditation practice uh, and then we'll see what happens from there and then uh, uh, we'll do some meditation together and then uh, uh, just uh, go slowly and the suttas I'm going to focus on, I'm going to be focused more on meditation themes uh, rather than kind of broader suttas. Of course, all the suttas matter. Uh, all the suttas are important because they give you the background, they give you the framework for meditation, all of this. Everything really matters. Uh, but there are some suttas that are more kind of useful for meditation practice. Uh, but uh, today I just want to give an overview uh, of meditation and it's very simple really, the kind of overview I'm going to give. Uh, so we'll see how uh, long it takes and what to talk about and then uh, we try it out afterwards and as always if you have questions there will be chances to ask questions uh, and there will also be some interview sessions and all of these kind of things as well. Uh, so uh, we'll see how things go. Uh, and uh, the um, thing about meditation uh, and I always rely on the suttas uh, for whatever I Whenever I teach about meditation practice, of course not just the suttas, also a little bit from my own experience and from people like Ajahn Brahm and other meditation masters you meet along the way. And uh, there are still meditation masters in the world, yeah, people who have kind of exceptional ability. Uh, and it's interesting, when you listen to what they say, it often kind of fits quite nicely with the suttas. Uh, and that's very reassuring. Uh, if the meditation master says one thing and the Buddha says the exact opposite, it's a bit problematic. <laughs> so it's good that they kind of agree with each other, otherwise we may be, you know, led on the wrong path or whatever. So that's really good news. Uh, so one of the things that I remember Ajahn Brahm was saying many years ago to me, he was saying to me that most people, uh, they go to the meditation object too quickly. Uh, yeah, they don't know the right time to go to the meditation object. You sit down and straight away you start watching the breath. Uh, but that is not really the appropriate way of doing things. Uh, and uh, because, uh, and uh, this w was reinforced with me when I started reading the suttas. The suttas, the word of the Buddha, of course. Uh, and I realized that what Ajahn Brahm was saying was exactly what the Buddha himself says in the suttas. Uh, if you look at some of the most important suttas about meditation practice, uh, you have the Anapana Sati Sutta, you have the Sutta on mindfulness of breathing, uh, obviously very important for meditation. Uh, then you have the Satipatthana Sutta, which is also kind of a core meditation sutta. Probably these two suttas are the most important suttas for meditation, yeah, and maybe the Anapana Sati is the most important one of those two, in my opinion anyway. Uh, so what do they say? And this is what is interesting, what they say, what the Anapanasati Sutta says is that before you watch the breath, yeah, before you watch the breath, there are certain things that you should do. Huh? And the most important things of those, well first of all you should set, uh, set the body reasonably straight, yeah, because it helps mindfulness I suppose. Uh, so you put the body straight, you put the, you, you, your legs cross-legged, uh, and then you establish mindfulness in yourself. Uh, then, once mindfulness has been established, then you start watching the breath. You don't watch the breath straight away, you wait to establish mindfulness first. Uh, yeah, so this, so you have to, we have to know how to give rise to the mindfulness, and then the watching of the breath tends to be smooth, it tends to be easy, it is natural, it is unforced, and all of these kind of things, which makes it really enjoyable, uh, makes it nice. Uh, otherwise, if you don't do it this way, that's why people end up with these things they call Samadhi headaches, 
Actually, it's a lack of samadhi headache. That's really the truth of it. <laughs> if it was a samadhi, you wouldn't have a headache. You would be okay here. So that is why these things come about, because you have to use force. You have to make yourself do these things, uh, when in fact um, it should be very natural, very easy. It should be enjoyable to meditate. Yeah? It should be something that we're really, really inclined towards. There shouldn't be some kind of self-torment that we get into, because in the long run it will give us some kind of, we hope, it will give us some kind of benefit. Uh, that is not how the Buddhist path works. Uh, the Buddhist path really is a path of happiness. Practice it right, it's happiness upon happiness upon happiness. So remember that, mindfulness has to be established first of all, then the meditation works. Yeah, This is how this thing kind of comes together. So what does the Buddha mean? What do the people mean when they say establishing mindfulness first? How do we do that? And the way to do that is to remember that when you come on a meditation retreat, or even just in everyday meditation, because we tend to be busy, we do all kinds of things, uh, the mind has a kind of momentum, it's restless, it is tired, it is all of these things. Uh, so you have to give yourself time for the mind to kind of gain a degree of clarity. The clarity is not going to be there straight away. Uh, so we have to know how to do things to give rise to clarity of the mind. So how does that clarity come about? And the very first thing the Buddha says to give rise to that clarity of that mindfulness, uh, I was just talking about the Four Noble Truths of the, over the weekend, and uh, very, very interesting. And in the most important sutta, maybe, on the Four Noble Truths is the Dhamma Chakra Pamatana Sutta, the setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. And in that sutta, before the Buddha talks about the Four Noble Truths, he talks about the middle way. The Majjhima Patipada is the first thing. Eh? And what does that middle way mean? And what that middle way means is this middle way between not indulging the body eh, and not tormenting the body. Yeah, Because in India at that time, either you indulged, you, were, you, know, you really enjoyed yourself, especially if you came from a kind of wealthy household like the Buddha, or if you were an ascetic, you tormented the body. Both of those are wrong. Eh? Both of those don't work. Eh? Why don't they work? Well, they don't work because if you indulge uh, and you torment the body, in either of those of those situations, the body is important. Either it's important because it gives rise to pleasure, or it's important because you want to get rid of the pain. Uh, either way, you cannot get rid of the body. You can't let it go. You can't focus on the mind. You can't be with the breath uh, because you are obsessed with the body to some extent. You're attached to it. You're holding on to it. All of these kind of things. Uh. So don't Torment yourself. Don't sit in a way don't, that you cannot relax properly. Huh? Uh, I mentioned a minute ago that you, you know, in the Anapanasati Sutta, it says you should have a straight body. But even that straightness only comes at the right time. If you force yourself to sit straight too early, it often means you can't relax properly. Huh? Yeah. So first of all, relax. Sit back. Lie down. <laughs> If you want to, you can lie down. I'm not going to say anything if you lie down. I say, I would probably say, yay, here's someone really relaxing. That's what I would say if you lie down. <laughs> so I would have compassion for you here. Yeah, and this, the point is that many people who are really good meditators, they lie down and get really good results. There's nothing wrong with lying down. It means that you relax. Yeah, it means that you are going well, especially if your mindfulness is fairly well established. It is not going to be a problem to lie down. Uh, when you start out, uh, sit on a chair. Yeah, you can sit a bit on the floor, a bit on a chair, uh, depending on what is comfortable for you. Lean against something if you have to. Some of the best meditators I know, they start out by leaning back. Uh, so they can really relax and let go of any tiredness of the mind or whatever before the mind becomes uh, comfortable and clear. Yeah? So this is the middle way. Uh, and I would say to most people, uh, if you're going to err, err a little bit on the side of indulgence. Uh, yeah? If you're going to make a mistake, err on the side of indulgence. Why? The reason is because at least indulgence isn't painful. At least indulgence is something that is easy to deal with. Uh, yeah? It's not a big problem. But if you err on the side of tormenting the yourself, on feeling pain, there's a double negative. There's a double negative. First of all, it won't work for your meditation. Secondly, it will be painful. Uh, at least the other way is going to be a little bit of a block in your meditation, perhaps, but at least it's not going to be painful. Huh? So uh, 
This is the Buddha's very first advice. Uh, yeah? Be at ease, be comfortable, uh, and be happy with uh, what you're doing. Uh. And um, what is fascinating, we're just uh, talking about uh, the Buddha yesterday, of course, to, to a little bit at least, and I was mentioning about what happened to the Buddha when he sat under the a tree, not the Bodhi tree, but when he was under the rose apple tree, when he was a child, uh, and his father was working in the field or whatever, and the Buddha was kind of, not the Buddha, the Buddha to be, he was sitting there. Uh, and uh, later on in the Buddha's life, there's another very interesting anecdote that the Buddha tells about his own life. This is found in the Bodhi Raja Kumara Sutta, Majjhimanikaya, Middle Link Sayings 85, where the Buddha is discussing with this prince called Prince Bodhi. Uh, and this Prince Bodhi, he says to the Buddha, happiness cannot be attained through happiness. Happiness must be attained through pain. This is the standard view of ancient India. You are a Jain ascetic, yeah? You cause as much pain as possible. Basically, that's almost what they did. And then you make spiritual progress on that basis. And then the Buddha replies to Prince Bodhi that, well, actually, that is not true. But that is what I too thought before my awakening. Yeah, the Buddha to be, he, even the Buddha had this wrong view, uh, that actually you give rise to pain, uh, then uh, that will kind of give rise to liberation. Even the Buddha, the greatest spiritual genius in human history, got this wrong. Uh. So it's a very deep problem in for human beings. You can, if the Buddha got it wrong, we can assume that the vast majority of people is gonna, are going to get it wrong. Uh. Yeah, so be very careful with that one, huh? because it's going to stop you and hinder you to make progress and to find that peace and ease of meditation practice. Huh? So this is the first thing, understand that this is a common problem in human psyche. So many people in Buddhist circles make this mistake of trying to sit through the pain, sit long periods of time, and the majority of those people make no progress. They end up giving up on meditation practice. Which is a shame, because this is a path which promises so much. Uh, and if you give up, because you get even the first instruction of the Buddha, you get that wrong. Uh, <laughs> this is the very first instruction of the Buddha, coming from the Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta. The very first teaching of the Buddha, the very first line of that teaching. Uh, and then we get that wrong, because we forget about these things, because our habits are so strong in an opposite direction. Because Buddhist culture has moved so far in a different direction sometimes. Uh, so this is the, uh, my first piece of advice. Try to just make sure you enjoy it. Make sure you don't torture yourself. Don't have too much pain. Relax, yeah? Have a good time. Uh. The second thing uh, I would recommend you to look for, it is a very simple piece of advice, but, but these are some of the most important ones. Uh. The other one I would, uh, uh, I would suggest to keep in mind is to remember that meditation is something very simple. Uh. Don't make it complicated. Uh, yeah, it is very, ba it is very something that kind of happens without trying very hard or doing very much. Or all you really have to do is kind of sit back and wait. Really, that's really all you have to do. Uh, it's a very simple thing. Uh, and when you listen to someone like Ajahn Brahm teach about meditation, uh, he will say things like, "Don't do anything here. Uh. Any more instructions? No, that's it. That's the only instruction. Don't do anything here." Uh. Yeah, and people say, what, what, <laughs> what, what do you mean, I don't do anything? Yeah, I don't understand, I don't understand, don't do anything, because we're so used to doing things, we don't know what it means to do nothing. Yeah. And uh, fair enough, you know, I don't, that's just, you know, universal thing, I don't think that's a bad, that we don't understand, that is just the way we are. Yeah. And uh, another example of that was when uh, uh, there was a group of uh, Australian meditators, they went to Thailand and they were going to seek out this great Thai meditation genius called Ajahn Ganha, who I've been talking about also over the this last few days a little bit. Uh, and they went to Ajahn Ganha and they said, Master, please, we, we don't really get meditation, we've been trying so hard. Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Brahm was with them, I think. Ajahn Brahm, we don't really understand Ajahn Brahm's teachings. Uh, he says, do nothing. What are we really supposed to do? Uh, and Ajahn Ganha said, okay, this is my, teach, my, teach, teach my meditation instruction. Breathe in, sabai. Sabai means relax, yeah, chill. Breathe out, sabai. That was it. <laughs> that was the end of the meditation instruction. 
We want something more. We want something, you know, we want to really know what we're supposed to do. Actually, that's it. That is really what meditation is about. Breathe in, relax, chill out, yeah, enjoy. Yeah. Breathe out, relax. If you can do that, really do that, then you'll be fine. And you will actually have success in your meditation. So it is so simple. And uh, it also, I was also reminded of this when we were just again talking about the Dhammachakka Sutta here. And we briefly talked about what happened to the Buddha under the rose apple tree. Huh? Because the, this was before he was a Buddha. He wasn't a meditator, he was a child. He was maybe 12 years old or something. Huh? Yeah, He had no idea about spiritual practice or anything of this. And yet, despite having no idea about any spiritual practice, uh, when he was sitting at the root of the Buddha tree, he got into a jhana. That tells us something very interesting. It tells us how you don't need much instructions, yeah? If you just relax, if you're a little child, you're just sitting there, you're kind of doing nothing, yeah? this is kind of the point of doing nothing, yeah? then jhanas happen automatically. Yeah? You go into samadhi. It shows you how simple it is uh, and how little instructions actually are required. Uh. So it's amazing, it never really occurred to me until, yes, until a couple of days ago when I thought about this fear, but there's actually something very interesting here. Yeah? Someone without, completely without instructions, uh, they are able to go into jhanas, uh, but people who get all of these instructions are not. <laughs> Isn't that kind of counterintuitive? It's really strange. Uh. And it reminds you also of the idea of the book that was published many years ago, a book that was called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. I don't know if you heard about that book. It was like a, a book that was very popular, especially in the West. I don't know about here in Malaysia, but in the West anyway. Uh, and and I'm, I don't know about the content of the book, but this idea of Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, is the idea that when you are a beginner, uh, like the Buddha to be under the rose apple tree, never done any meditation before, uh, you have this openness about things. You don't have any preconceived notions. Uh, you allow things to be. Uh, you don't try very hard. Uh, and things just happen as a consequence. And uh, so, interesting. And then you come to the suttas and how the Buddha teaches meditation. Uh, yeah? And uh, one of those things that the Buddha says about meditation practice is that uh, when you move through the stages of meditation. The stages are just personal experiences, yeah, mental experiences. Uh, you move from, uh, you know, non-regret. First of all, you have the virtue, which is kind of the foundation of meditation practice. You have the non-regret, the gladness, the pamuja, the piti, the pasadi, the sukha, all of these stages uh, that we experience as part of the meditation. We're going to have a look at that sutta later on. It's a very beautiful sutta talks about the personal experience of these things. Uh, and what the Buddha says in there, which I always point out on meditation retreats, he says that when you go through those stages, uh, it is not to be done by an act of will. Na chetanaya karaniya literally means not to be done by an act of intention, actually cannot be done by an act of intention. Uh, and if it isn't to be done by an act of intention, well, how is it done? Well, it is done according to nature. It's dhammata. Dhammata means according to nature. So this process is a natural process. If the basic foundation is in place, it happens by itself. And if the basic foundation is not in place, it's not going to happen. Anyway, yeah, you can't make it happen by willpower. So it's very simple. And the most, one of the most important things is just this ability to let go, ability to sit back, allow things to be. And if you can do that, then uh, you will go as far as your mind is ready for her. Uh, yeah, wait, uh, just enjoy, yeah, just be with the present moment. Don't do much about it. Uh, allow things to be. Stop controlling. Uh. And one way that I like to think about this, yeah, because it's, it's hard to understand exactly what does it mean not to control. Now one way of thinking about this is, as I was mentioning the other day, is that imagine that you've been to work, yeah, you are really exhausted because of your work. Sometimes we work, I'm sure you work really long hours. I know what people are like these days, uh, pretty much everywhere around the world. People work long hours, uh, and when you eventually come back home, you're really exhausted, you're mentally drained, there's no energy left. Uh, have any of you ever had that feeling? Yeah, yeah. Oh, everyone has had that feeling sometimes. Yeah, it's just uh, one of those things that happens when you work too hard. Uh, then what do you do uh, when you come back home? You might s just sit down in your m most comfortable chair and just kind of, whoa, <sighs> <sighs> <laughs> take a deep breath because you are so exhausted. Uh. 
What, so, and what do you do when you sit down in that chair? Do you do anything? Don't do anything, right? Because you exhausted, you just kind of let everything be. You don't try to do anything. You don't try to watch your breath. <laughs> That's the last thing you want to do. You just relax. This is what real relaxation is about. You just let go completely. You allow your mind to run. You allow things to be. You allow the tiredness to be there if it is there. Yeah. You don't do anything when you come back and you sit down in your favorite armchair or whatever it is. You allow the world to kind of run by. And this is a little bit like meditation. Except that hopefully you're not so exhausted. That's the only difference. You're not so as exhausted. Yeah, that's the difference really. But otherwise, the idea to just let things be here and allow the world to go on its own, uh, that is really what this is about. Uh, so imagine that thing. Yeah, you're just resting as if you're resting in your armchair. Uh, you're resting in a place where you're just allowing the world to be. It's a very nice way of understanding what we mean by not making any effort. Uh, yeah? because you really are allowing things to be. So watch yourself, uh, yeah? And based on that, know whether you are sitting in the right way, whether you are relaxing properly, and all of these kind of things. Uh. And as you do this, uh, what happens if you really don't put any effort into things, if you don't try to make the meditation work, uh, the mind starts to calm down all by itself, because you're taking away the fuel that makes the mind busy, restless thinking and all of these kind of things. And when you take away the fuel, of course, then the fire com comes down. The fire depends on fuel. When there's no, f no fuel, the fire can't be sustained. The restlessness will not sustain itself uh, and your mind starts to become pe more peaceful. Uh, and that is where you will feel the mindfulness coming through. Uh, yeah, the, the, thinking s the thinking stops. Uh, the tiredness starts to get alleviated, so you get more clarity. Uh, and that combination of more clarity, coming from the tiredness being gone, uh, and also coming from the restlessness disappearing, that combination uh, of peace and clarity, uh, that really is what mindfulness is about. Uh, you are emerging, you're starting to really feel the world around you. Uh, you see what is going on uh, right here in the present moment, uh, and you can see, feel the mindfulness emerging in this way. Uh. And uh, many, many of you will know this, at least to some extent. Yeah, uh, and you may not know superpower mindfulness that Ajahn Brahm talks about, but you have at least uh, some mindfulness, uh, and you know what that means. Uh. So this idea of clarity uh, and being in the present moment, uh, that is what mindfulness really is about. And that comes in many, many different degrees, uh, many different strengths. Uh. So, uh, what then? And uh, what then is that as your mindfulness starts to arise a little bit, uh, yeah, there will come a point as you do this, and your mind may still not really want to be in the present moment. Yeah, there is a little bit more clarity, uh, but still there are habits and things that are keep the mind restless and thinking and all of these things. Yeah, this is even though you start to get mindfulness, still the mind has this problem very often. Uh, so we need something more to kind of calm the mind down properly, to make sure that it actually leans in the right direction. This depends a lot on how much meditation experience you have. Uh, if you are a good meditator, you've done a lot of meditation before, your mind may incline more naturally to meditation, but that's like a minority of meditators. Uh, most of us need to a little bit more support, a little bit more ideas on how to uh, make the mind remain in the present moment. Uh, and that's what I will do now. Okay, so now we have kind of done the basics. Well, what then? Yeah, if you're not Ajanganha, if you're not an Arahant, if you're not the Buddha, then you may need a little bit extra to guide you. And these things that you use to guide you, I will call them like nudging the mind. Yeah, this nudging the mind is like a little reflection or a little perception, uh, a little way of thinking about life and thinking about meditation that makes the mind incline towards the present moment rather than inclining to thinking about this and that and all of these things. Uh. So what is this about? And what this really is about, uh, it is about giving priority to your meditation rather than giving priority to the rest of your life. Uh, giving priority to the spiritual part of your existence uh, and not giving priority to your worldly aspect of your existence. This is what this really is about. Uh. And um, to illustrate what I mean is uh, 
take, for example, the modern mindfulness movement. Yeah, the modern mindfulness movement is probably doing a lot of good for many people. Yeah, you hear people getting good results, but it also is very limited in its ability to deliver. It can only deliver so far. Yeah? And one of the reasons for that is because in the mindfulness movement, the purpose of the mindfulness movement is not so much a spiritual path. They don't really have any spiritual ideas at all. It's a secular practice. The idea is really just to make your ordinary life better. Yeah, so you have good mindfulness, it means, okay, now we can work harder. It's a kind of a... So you can work more, or be more effective at work, or you can be a better parent, or you can be whatever it is, yeah, because you have more mindfulness, you have more emotional control, your emotions are more cool, and all of these kind of things, uh, yeah? That is really what it is about, but the purpose is to make your ordinary life better. So your priority is the ordinary life, mindfulness is just a tool to support your ordinary life. So meditation is secondary, your ordinary life is primary. And when you do that, what happens is that uh, your mind will incline naturally to think about your ordinary life because it is more important to you. Whatever is important to you, that is where the mind will like to go. It will hang out. So if you have some problems in your ordinary life, and we always have some problems, it's almost impossible to have no problems at all. There's always something that needs to be solved or sorted out or, or, or dealt with. Yeah, or That's at least how it seems, even though it may not really be true in the bigger picture of things. So because of that, the mind we may have a degree of mindfulness, but the mind will always come back to those worldly things uh, that are more important to you. Uh, you will think about your job, uh, you will think about your family, uh, you will think about whatever other problems that you may have in life. Uh, that is where your mind will incline. Uh. So what we need to do, we need to invert this, uh, and we need to give priority to the spiritual practice, to the meditation, above the worldly life, the worldly, our all other aspects of our life. Uh, that is really what a, a big trick is, because if you give priority to your meditation, if you give priority to the spiritual path, that is where your mind will incline. Uh, and then your mind will incline to the peace. Uh, it will incline to the peacefulness. Uh, it will incline to all of these other things instead. Uh, and you won't really be interested in your ordinary life so much. Uh, yeah, This is the kind of the trick that actually makes this whole thing possible and makes it very powerful. And that is why someone like Ajahn Gandha or the Buddha, Ajahn Brahm, why their meditation is so powerful? Because their only interest is in the spiritual path. Letting go of the world like that is so easy for them. Uh, there's nothing of interest in that world. Uh, and we need to try to approximate that same kind of attitude. Uh, so how do we do that? Uh, and how to do that is just to understand more about Buddhism to understand where real happiness and contentment lies in life, uh, to understand that the world will never give you real happiness and contentment. Uh, the world will always be problematic to some extent. Uh, you can solve one problem, another problem arises just behind. There's no solution there. And then you die in the middle of solving problems. Uh, you get reborn and straight away you continue solving problems yeah, in your next existence. Uh, and that's what you have been doing for how, who knows how many eons. And where has it got you? Nowhere. <laughs> This is kind of the Buddhist outlook. It's a bit bleak, you have to say, but there is a solution. That's the kind of the good part to this. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that makes you wonder, where do I really find real contentment and happiness in the world? If the worldly life is just this eternal merry-go-round, which never you find any real solution, let it be here. It's all this problematic. Let it all go. Chuck it out the window. And then come back to the spiritual path. Uh, and this is what we mean by right view. This is why right view is so important, uh, because this is really part of, of that right view in the world, where happiness is really to be found, what should be prioritized, what really matters in life. Uh, this is a very important part of this idea of right view. Uh, yeah, and this is why I, I like to do the Four Noble Truths, because they actually give you that right view, that idea of where real happiness is to be found. Uh, you never get what you want in the world. It's always problematic. It always lets you down in the end. Why am I worried about that? Uh, let me instead look at the spiritual aspects of life. Then you are on the right track. Uh, there's a lot of very powerful teachings in some of those very simple teachings of the Buddha. Everything that is dear and beloved to you must become otherwise, must become separated from you. Uh, 
This is basically saying that the world is always going to let you down. That is what it's saying here. So this is how you, so you just remind yourself very simply of what is important in life. What really matters? What actually is going to get you somewhere? Wow, I got these teachings of the Buddha. This is where happiness lies. This is the right direction. And then you kind of, the mind loses interest in your ordinary life. It lets go of your family, at least for a while, at least while you're meditating. It lets go of your work, yeah, while you're meditating. It lets go of all this other stuff that is interesting in the world. And now, coming back to the spiritual path, back to meditation, back to the breath, and these kind of things. Uh, it's, it's actually very simple. It's very easy. It's just that it is, we're not used to thinking in this way, and that is why it kind of gets harder. And of course, it is not, people sometimes think, oh, this is like being very callous and cold-hearted, yeah, because I'm not thinking about my, my children and my spouse and my family members or my job, I'm supposed to care, yeah, and this is like not caring, but it is not really true at all, because uh, this is caring in a more profound sense, uh, where you care, by making your own qualities strong, which in, in the long run will also enable you to resolve the worldly problems better. They may not mean so much for, to you anymore, those worldly problems. You may think, yeah, whatever, it doesn't matter so much. But precisely that sense of detachment, that sense of being mindful, actually enables you to be more effective in all parts of your life. So actually it is a very positive thing for everything that you do. This is kind of the good thing about this. So. Yeah, so when you see your mind going in the wrong direction, remind you where to find real value. Uh, remind you where real happiness and contentment is to be found. Uh, remind you of uh, this, and then your mind will incline towards that. Uh, this is why it's such a blessing to have a spiritual aspect to one's life. Uh, this is why this is so profound, uh, because it gives our life real meaning. The majority of people don't really have that, uh, and you end up Eventually you die and you wonder what was the point of it all, because uh, it just seems so empty and pointless very often. Yeah. So this is uh, how you go, and gradually as you do this, your mindfulness becomes stronger, yeah. and there is that beautiful verse that is found in the Bad Eka Ratta Sutta, Majjhimanaka 131, One Auspicious Night. It's one of those fundamental verses in the Dhamma that the Buddha teaches, uh, and uh, it's very simple, uh, but very very useful. What the Buddha says that you should uh, not run uh, to the future, go into the future, nor should you run back into the past. Uh, you should not go to the future because it hasn't come yet. You shouldn't go to the past because it's already finished. Uh, instead, you dwell in the present. Uh, vipassati, you see into the present with, cl with clarity. Uh, the Pachupanna Dhamma, the present state. Uh, yeah? This is what you do when mindfulness arises. You give up these other things uh, and then mindfulness comes about. Uh, give up the past, uh, give up the future. Uh. So, I've already given you some idea how mindfulness comes about. You can nudge your mind a little bit in this way. Uh, and, uh, but the future and the past, yeah, still they tend to come into our minds a little bit. So I'll give you a little bit more advice on how to give up the future and the past. Uh, I hope I'm not talking too much. I'll talk a little bit more, but uh, too much instruction is always a bad idea. I know, I know what it's like. So uh, much better to say, breathe in, sabai, breathe out, sabai, stop. That's the best instruction, yeah? <laughs> Short, concise, to the point. But you have to understand what that means, and this is kind of what I'm trying to kind of bring out, what this simple instruction really means in practice. So um, how do we give up the past and the future when they interfere in our practice? And uh, the future, again, the idea is that the future, very similar to what I was talking about now, the future is just so unreliable, so uncertain, we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, we don't know when death is going to come either, because of all of those things. I like to think to myself, I have no future. Future doesn't really exist, because I have no idea what's going to happen. I might die before any of these things come, so, so why should I be bothered about it? Uh, I have no future. Hooray, I have no future. Usually when you say to people, you have no future, it's kind of put down. Yeah, you, you have no future, you're kind of a no, no, no good person. <laughs> but in Buddhism, it's good to, not to have a future. It's a kind of a positive thing. You can let it all go, put it all, put it all away. 
I have no future. Actually, it's one of those positive little mantras. Uh, so remind yourself when you sit down, I have no future. Uh, and see what happens. Uh, and see if you can let go of the entire thing. Uh. So, and it's actually quite realistic, uh, because uh, we think about the future, it turns out different anyway. Uh, or we think about the future, it doesn't happen at all. Uh, or we die around the corner, whatever it is, uh, very often it is so different. Uh. But um, sometimes one of the more difficult things to let go of can be the past. Uh. And um, again, this is something I will talk more about later on during this retreat. Uh. But a lot of the thinking about the past is often connected with perhaps regret yeah, or remorse. Uh, you may think about something that you have done or something that someone has done to you. Uh, and these things can often become big hindrances in the meditation. Uh, because uh, these things that we have done or others have done can uh, tend to come back to us precisely if we have done it, it's kind of a bad karma. And bad karma can obsess our minds a little bit. Uh. So we, n to be able to overcome those kind of things, uh, you need to learn how to let go. Uh. Yeah, this is one of those, let go is one of those fundamental things in Buddhism. Uh. And in this particular case, the way to let go is to be able to forgive uh, the past. This is so important, yeah, and this is one of those critical issues that make it possible again to be peaceful in meditation practice. If you have regret, yeah, it is impossible to be peaceful. The whole sequence stops at the very beginning if you have regret. Uh, that sequence I was just talking about before, it starts out with sila, then comes non-regret, then comes the pamuja, yeah, so virtue, non-regret, then comes the gladness, and then comes all the other things. If you have regret, it doesn't even begin. You're blocking yourself at the very beginning. So the first way of overcoming regret is to live well. That's why sila is the foundation for meditation practice. Yeah, live well, not, as, not just well, but as well as you possibly can. Yeah, up the game to the maximum. Be super duper kind and avoid doing kind of bad things. Then you're putting in the, that foundation. But also, it is about how we think about things that we have done as well. It is about reflecting in the right way, understanding how to forgive. How can we forgive? And the way you can forgive both yourself and others is always to remember that we are conditioned. Everyone is conditioned largely to do what they do. People don't usually have much choice. The conditioning is so powerful. Uh, if someone does something bad to you because they have no choice, because they are like a robot, uh, how can you be angry with them? Uh? And we are much more like robots than we think we are. Uh, it feels like we have all these choices, but actually how much choice do you really have? Uh, the more insight you have into the nature of the mind, the more you understand that we are following this course uh, that was laid down a long time ago, and now we are trapped in that course. Uh, yeah, it's like we are on the, like a train on rails and we have to follow the rails. The train can't go outside the rails and we're a bit like that. Uh, it's a trap from the past, uh, a trap from the conditioning that we have. Uh. So when people do bad and they are just like robots, it's easy to forgive. Uh. Yeah, it's easy to let go because they, are, they actually probably want to be kind. They just can't be kind because of that conditioning. Uh. Then you can let go of what other people did to you. Uh. And then you start to realize, actually, I'm the same. Yeah, I too am probably just like a robot. How easy is it to always be kind? You can't. It's very hard to always be kind. Everything we think, everything we say. And the reason why it's hard is because of habits, conditioning, and all of these things. Uh, so forgive yourself. Uh, yeah, it's okay. You made a mistake. What do you expect? Uh, you are conditioned to do these things. Uh, yeah, it's, it's all right. Uh, yeah, everyone, everyone does these things. Okay, now you can see the conditioning, so maybe now you can do better in the future, because you understand where it's coming from. Uh, but uh, uh, also, you understand that uh, the right thing, the right way to look at yourself, is to forgive. Uh. And this is why, if you become a stream mentor, yeah, when you are a stream mentor, because you understand the idea of non-self fully, you forgive yourself fully. Uh. And that's why stream mentor can never be reborn in a bad state because they always forgive everything they have done and they can let go of the past. Uh, that is kind of the power of stream entry here. Uh. So, live well. 
yeah, but that's kind of is, uh, kind of that is depends on kind of the big picture of things. You have to live well over a long period of time. So live well, and then forgive yourself for the remainder of mistakes that you make. Uh, those two things together, you can let go of the past a lot. Uh, so now I have given you a few ways to nudge the mind. Yeah, don't think obsessively about any of these things that I have said in meditation. Uh, just remind yourself a little bit uh, that if the meditation isn't going well, just use that as a kind of slight reminder. Okay, w w where am I placing my interest? What is important in life, etc. And then you will kind of be moving in the right direction. Uh. So there's one ingredient that is missing from all of this. Yeah? Now, if you do this, then you hopefully you, your mind will become more mindful. If it doesn't uh, become mindful, it's, there's no guarantee that mindfulness will arise. Uh, it depends on all the other factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, but the one ingredient that is missing uh, at this point is happiness. Joy in the mind, gladness. Uh, when gladness starts to arise in the mind, that becomes the most powerful thing uh, to keep you in the present moment. Uh, you make the present moment the pleasant moment. When the present moment is the pleasant moment, uh, you don't want to be anywhere else in the whole world. You want to be right here, right now, because it is so joyful and happy. Uh. So how can you make the present moment happy? Uh? And this is one of the things, that surprisingly enough, that when you read the suttas, uh, is something the Buddha emphasizes and talks about a lot. Uh, yeah, various ways of giving rise to joy in the mind. It's a very important part of the Buddha's teachings. Uh, and uh, simple ways of doing that. The Buddha has kind of six main themes that he talks about, which we have probably heard about many times before. Yeah, the Chaga Nusati, Sila Nusati, Buddha Nusati, and these things. Uh, but uh, the simple ways of doing that is, uh, you know, things like coming here to the BGF and just uh, uh, enjoying the company, enjoying the fact that you are here, that you have this opportunity, and what a wonderful thing it is that there is such an organization here in, K in KL, that uh, uh, you have such good spiritual friends coming together, that people have put in money and effort to build this, uh, that everyone is kind of supporting each other, people with good intentions. Wow, there's so much positive to look at there, yeah? And then have a sense of positive attitude towards your fellow meditators and spiritual companions, uh, the sense of metta, that there are such good people in the world. Uh, because the people who are here with you today are good people. If you weren't good, you wouldn't be here. Uh. <laughs> right? What's the point of being here if you don't have some good intention? Your only, your only reason you're here is because you have a good intention, otherwise you wouldn't be here. And that good intention is worth celebrating. Uh, it's worth having a sense of very positive feeling about people who are, at the very least, they are trying their very best. They have a good intention. What a wonderful thing that is. Uh. And uh, so, this is a simple way of just counting your blessings, uh, yeah? feeling that you are blessed because you have things in life uh, that many people don't. Uh, you have this support, you have support of, uh, in, in so many different ways. You have good teachers, you have the Buddha in the background giving you all of these wonderful teachings. Uh, and all of these things coming together is a wonderful thing in your life. Uh. So this is a way of developing a bit of metta, a bit of loving kindness, and a bit of compassion for the people around you. Uh, and that is a very, very powerful way of uh, giving rise to a bit of joy. Uh. So that's one way. Another way of giving rise to a bit of joy in a meditation uh, uh, is, again, this is also about gratitude, yeah, when you enjoy what you have and you count your blessings. So gratitude is also part of that. Uh. So gratitude is then one way. Another way of thinking about this is to uh, sometimes think about something you have done in the past uh, that give rise to a lot of joy and happiness. Uh, yeah, You may think about something you did, uh, and the Buddha specifically calls this Chaga Nusati, the recollection of your generosity uh, or support of others. Uh, so just try to allow your mind to kind of, well, what, what have I done? recently or not so recently, that gave me a sense of satisfaction and contentment when I felt really good about myself. Uh, and bring that back to mind, uh, yeah? The fact that you have done that. Or it can be a more general thing that you are generally a generous and kind person. And see what that feels like when you bring that to mind. Uh, yeah, the chaga nusati, the feeling that of good things that we have done in the past. Uh, or the sila nusati, recollection of the virtue. Uh, 
Yeah, it's a similar kind of thing. You may, many of you will have kept the five precepts for long periods of time. What a wonderful thing that is, to keep the five precepts for long periods of time. Not only that, but regularly you also keep the eight precepts, yeah, when you go on retreats and these kind of things. This is all very powerful and very wonderful. Uh, you're creating a better world, you're creating more harmony in society, you're giving other people and other animals freedom from oppression and fear because you are no danger to anyone. Uh, if you don't steal, if you don't kill, if you don't torture other beings, uh, it means that other beings can feel safe in your presence. Uh, yeah? What a wonderful gift that is to the whole world. Uh, Think about things like that, uh, yeah, and you've been doing this for a long time, uh, and then you under start to understand that actually what you're doing here is something wonderful. It's not selfish at all, it actually helps the entire world around us uh, when you live in this way. Uh. Think about your Kalyanamitas. Uh. Your Kalyanamitas are your friends here at the BGF, other Buddhist friends you may have. Uh, it is the Sangha members around you that may be giving you support. Uh, it is, in the end, it is the Buddha, is the kind of number one Kalyanamitta. This vast network of Kalyanamittas that we all have. Uh, yeah, lay Kalyanamittas, monastic Kalyanamittas, the Buddha Kalyanamitta, and all of these things coming together. Yeah. What a wonderful thing it is to have people in, in our lives that support us, that care, that make a difference, uh, that do something special to make our lives better. Uh, it's powerful, it's wonderful. And when you think like that, you start to feel really, again, blessed that you have this uh, amazing um, network in society around you that supports you in this way. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, so bring that to mind as well, the Kalyanamitta recollection, which actually is a recollection found in the suttas uh, as well, in addition to the recollection of the Sangha and all of these kind of things. Uh. So this is the way to gain some little bit of happiness in your meditation practice uh, and to kind of bring up those good feelings. You will notice that all of these happinesses are spiritual happinesses. Uh, they're not happiness that have to do with the world, with sensuality. These are pure happinesses of the mind that arise because of spiritual practice, uh, because of uh, uh, the good conduct, etc. in the long term. That is the kind of happiness that we really want to focus on. Uh, Get away from the worldly happiness, move towards the spiritual happiness, uh, and then you will be on the right track. Yeah. Um, very briefly, towards the end, let me also just give some very brief instructions on how to do uh, metta meditation, uh, metta, the loving kindness meditation, uh, because this ties in very nicely with the samatha and the breath meditation because when you get them both together it, they become very, they support each other here. So how to do metta meditation? And there's many ways and many of you will already have your own ways of meditating and please meditate exactly the way you feel comfortable with. Yeah, Follow the technique that works for you. See if what I say makes sense and it, take it on board if you like but really follow, your, follow what you uh, what you what works for you it's important to be independent yeah in one's meditation practice not to follow ideas and methods too strictly if you follow it too strictly very often you just end up kind of locking yourself in and not being flexible enough to kind of find your way through this and you may eventually give up as a consequence so be wise about all of this but the way that you find in the suttas the way the buddha talks about meditation metta meditation what is interesting about it, often he starts off uh, yeah, by uh, forgiving, letting go of people that you have problem with in life. Uh. So metta, because it is supposed to be a universal feeling, yeah, yeah, if there is someone that you have a problem with, someone who has been treating you badly or saying bad things to you, first of all you have to let go of that, forgive them, uh, yeah, get that out of the way. Uh. Because even if there is a single person who upsets you, uh, that will block your ability from having real metta, because that will be at the back of your mind, it will do something to you. You will notice this is quite different from the ordinary way of thinking about metta meditation. The ordinary way is to kind of start with a circle of the people you respect the most, and then expanding it to the neutral people, and then bringing in people maybe you don't like. But actually, the way the Buddha teaches it, first of all, neutralize anyone you may not like, anyone who's difficult, forgive them first. Yeah, if you are, if you've been a good Buddhist 
for a long time, you probably don't have many enemies anyway. You've probably given up the idea of having enemies. And, if, and we shouldn't really, yeah, it's, it's not having enemies, it's a very bad idea. So please don't have any enemies at all. Other people may be, they may take you as an enemy, but that's their problem. Yeah, at least you won't have them as an enemy. So don't have any enemies in life. And if there is, and when you don't have any enemies, you have a very good basis for metta meditation. If there's one person then who is problematic for whatever reason, you focus on that to let go even of that enmity. So the whole world again becomes friendly towards you. There's no one in the whole world that you have any ill will or negativity towards. Such a beautiful thing when it happens, yeah? What other people do is irrelevant, uh, got nothing to do with you. Uh, let them do what they want, uh, but at least you are not going to have enmity towards others. Uh. And uh, so this is the first stage. Uh, and then when you have developed that first stage, uh, then uh, uh, the idea of metta is to see the positive qualities in other people and other beings. Uh. Yeah, so what you do, you bring to mind all of these beautiful qualities that people have in the world. Uh, and there's a lot of people with beautiful qualities out there. Uh, there are people today who are, you know, very well developed in mind. Uh, there are people that you may never even have never met, but there are people like, uh, you know, people you meet, some of these, I'm always amazed you meet people who have all these beautiful qualities. Uh, I mean, take again Ajahn Ganha as an example. It's very powerful when you are in the presence of someone like that. Uh, and so remember that, yeah, bring this to mind. What does it mean to be really generous? Uh, what does it mean to be really kind? Uh, and then remember that there are lots of people in the world like that. Uh, and then you kind of establish in your mind a certain direction, like it says in the suttas, the nor northern direction, the eastern direction. Remember, all of these people with these good qualities are there. And just focus on the fact that all these qualities exist in the northern direction, all the people in that direction. Uh, and then see what happens in your mind. Uh, and if you get that right, it will give rise to a very beautiful feeling. Uh, and that is a feeling of metta. Just seeing the fact that there is so much goodness out there in the northern direction. People you have never met. Uh, you don't have to do it towards anyone specific. Uh, just everyone in a certain place. Uh, and the world is full of good people. There's all kinds of people in the world, but there's so many good people, so many good-hearted people in this world. Uh, and as a Buddhist monk, you get to meet a lot of them. Uh, one of the benefits of being a Buddhist monk. Yeah. And then you keep on doing that to the northern direction, and you take it around to the various directions, uh, and you kind of change your perception a little bit. I will do a guided meditation on this later on. You change your perceptions a little bit, uh, and then you learn how to give rise to these positive feelings uh, based on that. Uh, this is one way of doing it. Uh, there are many ways of doing metta meditation. Do whatever works for you. Uh, yeah? Do what you feel works uh, and don't follow any one method slavishly. But uh, the point here is that metta is about seeing good qualities. Uh, anger is about seeing negative qualities. Uh, metta is about seeing the positive. So focus on those positive qualities. Uh, see other people and the world like that. Uh, that is where metta comes from. Uh. I will later on, I will uh, talk about one of my favorite suttas on overcoming anger and developing metta, uh, because I always talk about it. Uh. <laughs> and uh, when you always talk about it, after a while you cannot get into it and you enjoy it, because uh, it is a foundational part of the Buddhist practice. So, I have talked for a long time, and uh, almost an hour, and uh, I'm going to uh, stop there, and uh, so let's have a short break uh, until about 10.30, and then we'll come back and we'll do some meditation together at 10.30.